starting on polymers, let me get these guys in the slides real quick. So carbohydrates, monomers like glucose, galactose, fructose, all those things join together. If two of them join together, it's a disaccharide too. If we have lots of these monosaccharides, lots of these sugars chained together using those dehydration reactions that we talked about, we get a polysaccharide, right? Many sugars chained together, right? And these come in a lot of forms, right? Starches, glycogen, cellulose, chitin, all right? So we'll walk through kind of examples of each of these. So start with starches. We've heard of starch, we eat a lot of starch probably. Um, they are polysaccharides found in plants. Right, glycogen would be kind of the analogous polysaccharide found in animals. And these are insoluble polysaccharides, right? A lot of times these things are used to store energy. So if it was soluble, that wouldn't be very helpful, right? If it just kept like kind of falling apart, right? So we have these insoluble polysaccharides storing energy, right? So they store metabolic energy and they're made up of alpha glucose molecules. We're not going to really go into these different forms of glucose. You'll get into it a bit in lab if you're in the lab. So I'm going to leave that to Menzel and Eagle to unpack. For our purposes, all we want to know is that starches and glycogen are made of chains of alpha glucose molecules, right? So they kind of, you get a bunch of these monomers chained together, you get these kind of branching chains and that is a starch. Okay. If you have chains of beta glucose, just a different form of glucose, you get cellulose. So polymers, right? Long chains of beta glucose form cellulose and these are long unbranched chains, right? Those starches were these big branchy looking chains, cellulose. You can kind of think of them as like very long, tough, ropey molecules, right? This is what we find. They make tough fibers. They're a main component of plant cell walls, right? So you even get kind of some structural function in things like cellulose. They're not easily broken down by most animals. This is fiber. If you eat lots of fiber, right? It keeps you regular because you don't break it down. It just kind of carries on with itself, right? Um, so generally speaking, animals can't on their own break down cellulose, the ruminants, right? Things with those big chambered stomachs, cows, goats, those sorts of things can, um, but it's because they actually have other organisms living in their gut that break them down for them. Right. So we've got starches and glycogen, right? Which our bodies can kind of break down and metabolize cellulose, which our bodies cannot easily break down. And then lastly, we have this other kind of funky polysaccharide called chitin, right? And so chitin is a polymer of N-acetylglucosamine, which you do not need to remember. It's just a, made of another kind of glucose, right? Starches and glycogen were alpha, cellulose was beta, chitin is another other, all right? And so the interesting thing with chitin is you get these polymers, right? These polysaccharide polymers, and they get cross-linked with proteins. So it's kind of a combination of two different kinds of biological molecules. And it makes this really tough, really resistant sort of material. So you find chitin in things like the exoskeletons of insects. It's also what makes up mushroom bodies. This is one of the, the many reasons a mushroom could make you sick and vomit because we can't process that chitin really well. Um, and so our bodies don't really like it. But chitin, right, is a polysaccharide kind of woven in with a protein to make this nice, really tough structural component in some living stuff. All right, so that was carbohydrates. Next on the list, nucleic acids, right? These are information storing molecules, which kind of like is a big deviation from what we think of like with carbs and lipids and things, right? Nucleic acids are big biological molecules that store information for the most part. So we're gonna talk about nucleotides, which are the monomers of nucleic acids, and then talk about those polymers. Mostly we talk about nucleic acids as DNA and RNA, and we'll actually spend kind of entire units towards the end unpacking what DNA and RNA are and do. 
So we'll go over them kind of superficially here. It may not feel superficially, but it is right. And then we'll talk, there's a few other nucleotides that we'll kind of tack on that do a couple other things. So nucleotides, right? This is in our monomer polymer list, right? We had monomers and polymers, monosaccharides, polysaccharides, nucleotides, polynucleotides, right? We're making our little list here. So the nucleotide in a nucleic acid, right? Our little monomer has three main parts, right? We've got a five carbon sugar. I'm not ever gonna ask you to draw molecules. So don't get super stressed with the molecule shapes, all right? But just know the pieces that are in there, right? So there is a pentose, a five carbon sugar. There's a phosphate group, which is a phosphorus basically a phosphorus surrounded in oxygen, right? So we've got a sugar attached to a phosphate on one side. And on the other side, we have this nitrogenous base, right? So it's these rings, they contain nitrogen and they are basic, right? So a nitrogenous base, a sugar and a phosphate, and then a little hydroxyl tacked on on the other side, right? So nucleotides have these three main parts and their identity, basically comes from that nitrogenous base. So basically there are five nucleotides total. And we kind of, we categorize them based on what this little guy looks like. So this is a purine. It's got two rings, it's got this little five-sided ring, and this little six-sided ring. So it's a purine, right? There are two kinds of purines, adenine and guanine. Guanine, hold up found in DNA and RNA. And then there are three pyrimidines. And these just have one ring. So instead of having this five here, it's like this little five is gone. They're just a little six-sided ring, All right? So pyrimidines are single rings. And depending on the stuff that's on them, right? They are cytosine, thiamine, or uracil, okay? So if you've ever like seen or heard people talk about DNA sequences, right? These are the a, C's, T's, and G's that everybody talks about, right? That code for information in your DNA. It's these nucleotides, right? Identified by these nitrogenous bases. Uracil is kind of this little weird guy down here. It's only found in RNA. We'll come back around to RNA in a second, right? So nucleotides, we've got five of them, right? Again, this is just kind of another way to look at it. I will not make you draw these or remember why they're different, right? Other than to say, right, our purines are the two ring guys, adenine and guanine, and our pyrimidines just have one ring. So that's uracil, thymine, cytosine, right? So. We've got these nucleotides, monomers. Lots of them together form our polymer, which is called a polynucleotide, right? Sometimes called nucleic acids, just as a type of compound. I always kind of, to keep, for some reason, in my head, I always get uh, the pieces of proteins and nucleic acids mixed up. One way to keep them straight, right? Your DNA is in your nucleus. So DNA is made of nucleus, nucleic acids or nucleotides. It's better if I don't stutter. All right, so polynucleotides. We form these polymers through dehydration reactions, just like everything else. And so when they connect, you have the phosphate of one group attaching to the hydroxyl of another. So you get so you kind of lose this hydroxyl, you end up with this sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate chain, right? The nitrogenous bases are just kind of hanging off to the side. They're not involved in the bonding at this stage, right? And so we call this a phospho, because there's phosphate in the middle, di to ester sugar bond. So it's a phospho di ester bond, two sugars linked by a phosphate. All right, so this is how these DNA polymers form. 
Now, generally, DNA exists as two strands, right? DNA classically, the double-stranded helix, right? So, what ends up happening is when these chains form, your single strand of DNA has a direction, basically, which makes sense, right? Your DNA holds information. You could think of it as like computer code or a book, something you would read. So it's gonna have a beginning and an end. And so we've got this OH hanging off one end, we call it the three prime end. And then we've got a phosphate hanging on this end and that's our five prime end. So we've got, right, it, it has a direction, right? It's polar, it's got ends, different ends. Earth has north and south poles, water has positive and negative poles, DNA has a three prime and a five prime kind of polar end, right? So there's a place to start reading this information and there's a place to stop. Now, it's important that your DNA is packed up and stable, right? Because it's basically the reference library for everything that's in your body. Right? It's all the code that makes you. And so DNA tends to be stored in the nucleus as a double-stranded molecule. And so what happens is the nucleotides, right? these nitrogenous bases in particular, are attracted, they pair up in a specific way. right? So guanine always pairs with a cytosine. Adenine always pairs with a thymine, right? And so all the way down, you end up with these two what we call complementary strands, right? So you've got this information that codes for amino acids for things that your body needs, and it's stored as a pair of molecules coiled together, a double helix, two chains of these complementary amino acids that are wrapped around each other. Right, and they're held together by hydrogen bonds. Right? So the nitrogenous bases are attracted to each other with these weak hydrogen bonds, right? Kind of like we saw in water, right? So you've got kind of a weak hydrogen bond between this hydrogen and this nitrogen, between this hydrogen and this oxygen, and et cetera, up through there. And it kind of draws those two chains together, holds them together and causes them actually to kind of twist. So you get that coil, right? DNA is always kind of shown as a coil, right? So you get your C's and G's paired together and your A's and T's paired together. It all curls up and it's stored in the nucleus that way. All right. Now, Got a couple forms that happen with these nucleotides, right? With these nucleic acids. So DNA, what we've been talking about, DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, right? DNA. So you've got these nucleic acids, adenine, cytosine, guanine, thymine, in a long chain with a complementary chain, right? We've got our double helix. And this is how we store hereditary information. Now, sometimes, we make copies of this DNA to use for things, and that's RNA, right? Ribonucleic acid. And so it uses four bases, adenine, cytosine, guanine, except for when we make a copy of DNA, we replace the thiamines with uracil. I don't know why, it's just what happens, right? And so this RNA is produced by transcribing DNA, right? So it's kind of like little ephemeral copies of your DNA. It is, uh, RNA transcription doesn't happen during cell replication. It actually happens during regular cell function, right? So when your cell gets ready to divide, we actually make an extra copy of the whole library, right? The whole DNA. But if my body just needs to make an extra protein, the part of my DNA that codes for that protein gets transcribed. And then this RNA that codes for that protein goes out into the cell to wherever it needs to be to make that protein. 
And it's usually single stranded, right? RNA is not for long-term storage. It's like, I need the directions to make this thing. I copy them down. I take them to where they need to be in the cell to make that thing, that protein, right? And so we tend to see RNA in three different forms. We'll talk about this in more detail later, but basically just kind of at this nice superficial level, all we're worried about right now, RNA can carry information from the DNA, right? To different places. And that's called mRNA, which just means messenger RNA. So RNA can serve as a messenger, carrying information from DNA to other parts of the cell. There are also, when we get into unit two, we're gonna talk about different organelles in your cell. You have ribosomes are one of those things and they're made of RNA. So RNA that gets transcribed to be a ribosome, as logic would follow is R, RNA, ribosomal RNA, right? So RNA that is used to carry information is messenger RNA. RNA that makes up your ribosome is ribosomal RNA. Lastly, you've got some RNA that's carrying amino acids. When your body is making proteins, right? You've got to link all these amino acids to get together and get there, right? And so you have transfer RNA that is transferring amino acids, moving amino acids around in your cell, okay? So DNA, large, stable, coiled up, kept in the nucleus for storage. RNA, single-stranded little copies, little notes of your DNA that are used to do things, to carry information, to create ribosomes, to build proteins. Okay. All right. And if... Again, I'm not gonna have you draw these, but the main structural difference is just, we've got this extra OH, right? That's why this is called deoxyribose because there's a hydroxyl missing, so deoxyribose, but we're not too worried about that. All right, so nucleotides, great. Polynucleotides, which are nucleic acids, which are DNA and RNA, but also there are a few other nucleotides that kind of float around and do mainly electron transport. So we'll see these guys again when we get to respiration and metabolism. But just to mention, this is an extra function of nucleotides, right? ATP, the energy currency of the cell is adenosine, right? Adenine up here is adenosine triphosphate. So we've got our pentose, our sugar. We've got adenine triphosphate. So adenosine triphosphate is an energy storing or an energy carrying molecule. These bonds hold lots of energy. We'll see that kind of in action later, but it's used for moving cells, moving things in cells, transporting things through membranes, right? All sorts of things. It's what photosynthesis and respiration are looking to create, it's ATP molecules. And then not that you need to memorize these super long names, but NAD and FAD are two other electron carriers that we'll see again when we get into kind of respiration and photosynthesis, right? So nicotinamide, adenine, dinucleotide. I don't know why I'm trying to say these out loud. Flavonadenine, dinucleotide, right? So nucleotides mainly, DNA and RNA for information storage, information transfer but also we've got a few kind of bonus nucleotides that work to move energy around, which we will see later. All right. Third group of macromolecules, we're halfway through, but proteins are a big one, so they'll take a bit of time. So we're gonna talk about proteins, right? We're gonna talk about Protein function, proteins do a lot of things in our bodies, which we're probably at least vaguely aware of, but possibly some things that we're not so aware of. And then we're gonna talk a lot about protein structure, right? Proteins are a super diverse group. They're all made of amino acids, but they are very diverse in form and function. So we're gonna kind of spend a little time unpacking that. All right, so 
what do proteins do? Basically everything, right? Enzymes, proteins are enzymes. Proteins function in cell defense, in transporting things around your body, in giving support to your body, moving your body, regulating kind of messages moving around. And then occasionally a little less often, right? We've got other things that are better at storing, but they do a little bit of storage as well. So basically proteins do, do everything, right? So let's unpack these a bit. So enzyme catalysis, right? So proteins, enzymes are proteins and enzymes are catalysts. So these are what we call globular proteins, just means they're kind of globby shaped generally, but they are globular very specifically, right? So every enzyme has a very, very specific shape depending on what it's made of and they facilitate chemical reactions, right? So there are chemical reactions that your body needs to happen and needs them to happen kind of at a certain speed. And so enzymes will either line up things so that they bond like your body wants or will stress things so that molecules break like they want. So we had that, um, the sugar example, right? A glucose and glucose, fructose, galactose, right? That we kind of linked together so we could move glucose through the body, but at some point you need to break it back apart and your body uses an enzyme to do that. So that disaccharide bumps into this enzyme that it fits in, right, just perfectly. The enzyme stresses the bonds and breaks it apart into our two monosaccharides again, right, so that your body can then metabolize glucose, for example, right? We'll spend a bit, we'll look at enzymes in detail in the next, I think in unit three, I think. All right, so proteins function as enzymes. Proteins function in defense. Again, these are more globular proteins, but they can recognize foreign microbes, cancer cells, right? Engulf and remove foreign bodies of various forms, right? So they're catalysts, they function in defense. They also serve as transport molecules, hemoglobin being kind of the big, easy example, right? So we've got red blood cells that move oxygen through our bodies, right? They come into our lungs, they take on oxygen, they leave through the rest of the bloodstream, take oxygen to all your cells. And that happens because inside your red blood cells are these hemoglobin molecules, right? Which are really good at carrying oxygen. So red blood cells, go into your lungs. The hemoglobin in the red blood cells takes on oxygen. Red blood cells move on to disperse that oxygen through your body, right? So transport. They also function in support, right? Protein fibers provide structure to your body. That's collagen, that's your skin, ligaments, tendons, bones, right? Are all made of protein. Your body has a structure because of proteins. Of course, probably the one that we think of most if somebody says protein is motion, right? Your actin and myosin filaments, it's what your muscles are made of. That's literally what moves your body around, right? Are these protein fibers? Probably going to leave kind of the specific workings of these protein fibers for an AMP class, but to know that one of the major functions of proteins in your body is moving that body around, right? Hormones are proteins, right? So proteins play a big part in regulation of processes in your body, right? Hormones that are made in parts of your body that communicate things to other parts of your body, let it know what needs to be happening, right? These intercellular messengers, they also function in gene regulation, right? What sorts of genes your body's expressing at any point in time. And lastly, 
and a little less common. Proteins are also able to do a bit of storage, mostly of ions, things like calcium and iron right, that your body might want to hang on to a bit to use. So proteins are incredibly diverse in function. And this means, and this is because they are incredibly diverse in structure. So we're gonna spend a bit of time talking about protein structure, right? And kind of what characteristics it is about the monomers and proteins that allow them to do all these things, right? Basic amino acid. So again, the monomer for proteins is the amino acid, right? And amino acids are at their base, pretty simple, right? It's a carbon with four things stuck to it, right? So there's a hydrogen, that's fine. It's not very interesting, but we've got an amino group, an NH2 and a carboxyl group, C double bonded to O and a hydroxyl group. And then that top guy up there, does anybody happen to remember or have spent a, more time than is reasonable staring at like tables and things? What is that R? Anybody remember? We saw R. Hmm? Was it represent? Maybe. Right, oh no, <laughs> not radon. That would be exciting. Oh yeah, it doesn't start with R. It, it couldn't be that easy. Um, it's a functional group, right? So there's kind of these, so yeah, so we've got our amino, our carboxyl, our functional group. We can ionize both of these groups and change the charge. We can have a positive charge here and a negative charge on this side, right? Which is kind of one level of how these amino acids are gonna start to do lots of weird folding and shaping of things. Right, we can kind of switch out our charges. And then this functional group up here, this last guy, is what will ultimately determine the nature of that amino acid. All right. And so we've got about 20 amino acids, referring to 20 different functional groups that we might see on an amino acid. All right. One last little sidebar for the shapes of these things. Remember we're talking about isomers. We talked about enantiomers, right? When you've got a carbon with four things stuck to it, right? You can form mirror images, right? So I can have this carbon with a carboxyl, a hydrogen, an amine, and some functional group. But I can rearrange these bonds to create a mirror image. Right, so they have the same things attached, but they're arranged differently so that they're mirror images of each other. And for whatever reason, I don't know why, in proteins, you know, we've got these chiral enantiomers, a right-handed one and a left-handed one. In proteins, you only see the left-handed amino acids. These guys are not found in proteins. I don't know why, just an interesting sidebar. All right, so. We've got five classes of amino acids, okay, depending on what functional groups get attached, right? So we can attach functional groups that are nonpolar, right? Hydrocarbons, right? They're not charged, they're not polar, right? They just kind of hang out. There's no kind of unbalance in the electronegativity. They don't carry any charge. Right, so we could have a functional group that's just kind of neutral right out there. We can have an amino acid with a functional group that is polar, but uncharged. Right which basically just means you've added a functional group with oxygen. Remember in our kind of options for biological elements, oxygen is just our most electronegative atom. And so when you add oxygen to one of these groups, it causes it to be um, electronegatively unbalanced. You end up with these partial charges, right? 
oxygen isn't coming in with a charge, but because it's pulling more on those electrons, you get kind of this partial charge wherever you add that oxygen. So you get a polar uncharged amino acid by adding oxygen. You could also just add a functional group that's straight up charged, right? You could add I, some kind of ionic group acids or bases that are carrying positive and negative charges, right? Things that can ionize, right? So you could add a group on that actually has a complete charge, either positive or negative, right? And all of these things, whether that group is nonpolar and not attracted to anything, polar and uncharged, right? It's going to change how all of these molecules interact with each other, how they fold up to form a protein. All right, number four, functional groups can be aromatic, which might mean that they have some kind of odor, but in chemical terms, it means that your R group is a carbon ring, right? And that ring alternates double and single bonds between the carbons in that ring. Again, we're dealing mostly with kind of carbon hydrogen bonds here. So this is also a nonpolar functional group. Right. And lastly, we have a few amino acids with functional groups that give them kind of a very specific special function, right? Because you've got all these amino acids coming together to make amino acid chains to make polymers. And there's a few of them that have very specific jobs within the protein. So something like methionine, right? When your cells are making proteins, frequently the first amino acid in the protein is methionine. It's like a signal that a protein is starting, right? So we start with methionine. Proline can be incorporated into these long amino acid chains to cause kind of kinks, right? So if you have a protein that needs a really sharp bend in it, you can use a proline, so an amino acid with a functional group that causes the amino acid chain to bend. And then cysteine, because as we'll see when we talk about the structure of these proteins, right, you've got these amino acid chains and some proteins are made of multiple amino acid chains all tacked together. And so your cells do that using cysteine. So cysteine is an amino acid that can link different protein chains together to make more complicated proteins, right? So when you start to kind of think about the way these amino acids are formed, what their structure looks like, you kind of get this idea that you can basically make any shape you want when you're putting together proteins, right? Which means that they can have those diverse functions. All right. So how do we put amino acids together? Basically the same way we've put every other set of monomers together, right? We're going to do dehydration synthesis, right? A condensation reaction. We're going to lose water and make a covalent bond. Same as we did with the carbs, same as we did with the nucleotides. Well, nucleotides were weird. Meh. All right, so we've got a hydrogen hanging out down here. We've got our functional group, whatever it may look like. Other two are this carboxyl and this NH2. If we kind of look at those with their component parts, right, you've got a nitrogen, bonded to hydrogen and hydrogen. You've got a carbon double bonded to oxygen and then a hydroxyl group, All right? So when we lose water in a dehydration reaction, we're gonna lose it right there, All right? Those are gonna come out and then we're gonna form, right? A covalent bond between the remaining carbon and nitrogen, All right? Take that water out, pop those two together. And this bond specifically that's formed between this carbon and nitrogen is called a peptide bond. Right. Which kind of adds yet another layer to the protein structure it actually kind of pulls back the other way it actually kind of constrains the way these proteins can fold because once this carbon and nitrogen are bonded together, you can't rotate at this bond these peptide bonds are not free to rotate. Right, which also helps determine the structure of chains of these amino acids. So it's this bond. So it's a single bond, but just because of the way carbon and nitrogen bond here, this single bond cannot rotate. Yeah. 
All right. So proteins are composed of amino acids, right? One or more long unbranched chains. You can just think of them like these pop bead chains, right? These long unbranched chains of amino acids and every chain of amino acids is called a polypeptide, which makes sense, right? It's basically a long chain of things linked by peptide bonds. So it's a polypeptide chain, All right? And the arrangements of these polypeptides and their functional groups determine the structure and their core function of the protein, right? Depending on what functional groups you have determines how that polypeptide chain is going to kind of coil up and interact with itself to form some shape, right? And we can see some things that we've talked about before, right? We've got polar and nonpolar groups. So pieces of this chain are polar, pieces of this chain are nonpolar, and it's gonna kind of curl up into some kind of a shape. And what will usually happen, because this is in our body and we're in water, right? You're going to see hydrophobic exclusion happen. All of the nonpolar functional groups and their amino acids are gonna get pushed to the center of the protein away from the water. The outside of the protein is going to be made up of amino acids that are polar or charged, right? Because that's what the water is going to want to attach to, right? So your proteins will generally have a hydrophobic interior and a polar or charged hydrophilic exterior. All right. So all of this is happening. So when we talk about protein structure, which is really complex, we divide it into levels, right? To kind of give ourselves some space to talk about it. The kind of different levels of folding of amino acids. And very straightforwardly, we call these four levels, primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary, right? Level one, two, three, and four one being the most basic level of structure and then quaternary being the most kind of complex level of protein structure. We might get through at least a couple of these. So primary structure is kind of what we've been talking about so far. Primary structure is this little pot B chain. It is just all of these amino acids, right? The sequence of the amino acids in the polypeptide chain, right? This is like level one, right? So you just have amino acid, peptide bond, amino acid, peptide bond, etc. Can be hundreds of amino acids long. It's just the chain. And remember, we're not even talking about the R groups yet, right? Because this is just that carbon bonded to the nitrogen. And so because R groups aren't involved in primary structure, you can put amino acids together in any order, right? Because everything else about the amino acids is kind of equal. So you can kind of pop these guys together in any order you like. And that is your primary structure, the amino acid sequence, All right? Up one level. All right, yeah. So basically you can create any, right? Just like I said, any order of amino acids it's a really big number of possible sequences, right? You've got lots of options. And so those polypeptide sequences begin to interact, right? The amino acids start to interact with each other. And that gives you initially your secondary structure. And so secondary structure is the hydrogen bonding that is going to happen between peptide groups, all right? And this generally comes in the form of, right? So you've got this chain of amino acids sometimes. And so they'll either form a coil, right? And so this is just kind of the hydrogens that are hanging off, interacting together. The polypeptide chain will either form a coil or it'll form a sheet. It'll either kind of like form kind of like a fan, like a folded up piece of paper fan or in a coil, all right? So secondary structure, and you don't have to worry about why or when each of them happens, but just the secondary structure is the peptide groups start to coil together or they form this kind of flat structure, right? And that's our secondary structure. Now, 
right? So this peptide chain is starting to kind of fold in on itself a little bit at tertiary structure, right? This is our final 3D shape. And this is determined by the arrangement of secondary structure, right? So now our R groups, now we're talking about R groups, our R groups are interacting, right? So the chain is kind of folded in on itself. It's either kind of made these sheet, right? These kind of flat stretches, or it's made these coils. And the R groups, whether they're charged or uncharged or polar, right? Start to attract or repel each other, right? Which causes this whole thing to start to fold and coil and fold and coil and create whatever it is the final protein structure is, right? All of these molecules are just interacting, right? Given the ionic bonds that might form, right? If you've got charged R groups, hydrogen bonds that will form between other maybe uncharged or polar R groups, right? And so you end up with this amino acid chain that has folded and folded and folded and created some shape. Right. Lastly, we have quaternary structure, All right? So we've got our amino acid chain. We had some hydrogen bonding that happened, it kind of made us some coils and sheets. And then all of that, the R groups start interacting, folding everything together. And then quaternary structure happens when two or more of these chains then link together. This is hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is actually made of four polypeptide chains, right? So we pull multiple amino acid chains together, they form some structure, and that is what we call a functional protein, right? And each individual chain is called a subunit of the full functional protein. Right, so primary structure, we've got our little pop B chain. That pop B chain starts to fold in either into coils or little folded fans. That secondary structure, the R groups start to interact with each other that gives us tertiary structure. And then we start attaching different chains together and that gives us quaternary structure. Right, so like we mentioned, this is determined by that amino acid sequence. Right, and this, we're starting to learn more about this because all of these amino acids are coded for by our DNA. So with next-gen DNA sequencing, we can create huge databases of nucleotide sequences, which are code for amino acid sequences, right? And in this kind of research, we've figured out two extra levels of protein organization. Right, kind of interlevels, just to make things more complicated. This will be the last, this is the end. Motifs and domains. So motif is between secondary and tertiary structure, super secondary structure, right? And so what we see are these motifs. Frequently we see like a beta followed by a beta sheet or an alpha helix tied to one of these little kink amino acids and another alpha helix or an alpha helix directly next to an alpha helix. So we see these patterns and how these things fold up, right? And so we have motifs between secondary and tertiary structure and then domains, which is kind of a subset of tertiary structure. So we see these protein domains within this amino acid and those will have separate functions within the protein. So we call them functional domains. Right, and so what this means is that as we start looking at proteins, we can look for these patterns, right? These structural domains that maybe occur in different proteins and start to kind of figure out like, you know, you've got this protein, you know what it does, but you can figure out what the individual pieces of that protein do, right? Relate them to other proteins, do this sort of thing. And that is enough, we are out of time. And so we will come back to that on Wednesday and we will finish up chapter three on Wednesday. Don't forget your quiz. Don't forget your lecture journal. If you have any questions coming up to the exam, let me know.